we're going to do a intrinsic example using a helix. For those of you who don't know, a helix is, you can kind of think of it as a stretched out slinky. And it's this track right here that kind of spirals as it goes up. I did this example because I thought it would be uh, good for visualizing our intrinsic basis. And um, I have a Python animation at the end that we're going to take a look at. And let's just first talk about conceptually what the basis is doing as it goes around, right? So our E sub T, our tangent direction, it's always tangent to our track, and our track is the, is the helix. E sub N always points towards the center of curvature, and then E sub B is E sub T crossed with E sub N gives you E sub B. All right, E X, E Y, E Z, this is our uh, inertial frame. It's, it's absolutely fixed. It doesn't move. And our task here is find the intrinsic basis. So let's first just talk about what would we do if we wanted to just have a circle moving in a plane, right? What if we just wanted our particle doing this in the E, X, E, Y plane? Well, what we would do is our X uh, coordinate would just be cosine T. And our y coordinate would be sine t, right? So our x direction, if it's just cosine t and it's changing throughout time, it's just going to oscillate back and forth, back and forth in the ex uh, direction. The sine of t is also going to have that sinusoidal um, character where it goes back and forth, back and forth. And if you combine both of these back and forth, right, we have ex here going back and forth, and then we have EY here going back and forth. Well, we just made a, a circle. And it's just going to, that particle is just going to go in a circle forever for all of time in the plane of EXEY. These constants we have, A and B, that, that controls the amplitude of that sinusoidal pattern in each direction, right? So say we had EY really big and EY is going back and forth like that. And EX is a little smaller say that A, A is smaller than B, well then now it's going to go back and forth here like that. Well, now you can see if we combine these two, well, now we're going in a circle, uh, well, not entirely a circle. We're going now in like an oval, right? We're going in an oval and we'll just go around and around in the E, X, E, Y plane for all time, right? So A and B kind of control our shape of our helix. Our final one here, uh, C of T in the E, Z direction, well, this now gives us a third dimension, right? So as we're going around in a circle or an oval, we're also going up. We're also going up. And that's what makes our helix, where C of T, the C, controls um, how quickly we ascend. All right, so we have our position vector. Great, this is our position vector of our helix, or of our point at any point in time traveling along the helical track. So what we want to do is we want to find the velocity of our particle. And we find that by taking the derivative of our position vector. Let's take the derivative of each component. Start with x. a is a constant. The derivative of e x, e y, and e z, the, the derivative of each of those is going to be 0 because we are not rotating. e x, e y, e z is inertially fixed. The frame doesn't move, right? And just a reminder, if we were to take the derivative of one of these positions, let's just say ex, it will be equal to the absolute angular velocity crossed with uh, the vector itself, ex. Well, this absolute angular velocity omega is zero. The frame isn't rotating. So this whole thing would just be zero. Same for ey and ez. Okay, so all we have to do is take derivative of cosine t. That's easy. It's negative sine t. This is our derivative, negative a sine t ex. Do the same thing for EY. Derivative of sine is cosine, so it's just B cosine T EY. And then derivative of CT, well, C is a constant. Derivative of T is 1, so C, easy. Next, we want to find the speed. Uh, speed is just the magnitude of the velocity vector, and it's denoted by these double uh, vertical bars. And the way we find the magnitude of a vector is we... Um, Square each of the components, add them together, take the square root. So that's what we're doing. Squaring this, squaring this, squaring this. 
and then we add them all together, take the square root, and that's it. And all I did here was just distribute that square to each of the components. So this right here, that's our speed. Recall that our tangent vector is defined as the velocity vector divided by the speed. Easy. So this is our velocity vector. We already found it. We found it right here. And then we're just dividing it by our speed. And that's it. That's our tangent vector. And all I did here was just split it into each of its components, right? So we have the EX component, which is this over the speed. We have the EY component, which is this part divided by the speed. And then finally, the EZ component, which is just um, this divided by the speed. So I just, I just split it up. We're going to go on a little aside here. Uh, and if you watch the previous video, it will be obvious why we're doing this. Um, but it's going to make our lives a little easier. So we're going to take the derivative of 1 over the speed, right? And we're doing this because uh, when we have to take the derivative of e of t, it's going to make sp splitting it up into a product rule easier. And just bear with me through this, all right? Just for the, for the time being, just know um, I'm going on a little aside to take the derivative of 1 over the speed. So to go from here to here, all I did was take the denominator, move it to the numerator, which bring, gives us a negative one-half power. And if we take the derivative of this here, well, first we bring down the negative one-half, brought down the negative one-half, multiplied by the inside, multiplied by the inside. You have to lower the power by one. So now it becomes negative three-halves. That's the power rule. And then now we have to take the derivative of the inside. And that's what we have right here. Right, so we bring down the 2 on the sine. So now it's 2a squared, derivative of the inside, sine t. And then, um, I'm sorry, we multiply it by the inside, which is the sine t. And then we multiply it by the derivative of the inside, which is cosine t. And then we do the same thing for the next term. Bring down the 2. So this becomes 2 times b squared, deriv uh, multiply by the inside, cosine t. And then you multiply by the derivative of the inside. So derivative of cosine is negative sine. That's where the negative sine comes from. And then sine of t. Um, moving this to the denominator here. And then also negative 1 half uh, kills the 2 and the 2 here. And then the sines reverse, right? So now this is b squared sine t cosine t. And then this becomes negative a squared sine t cosine t. Okay. I'm going to call this whole term here that we took the derivative of, this 1 over speed, this is going to be called alpha. This is going to be called alpha. So what we just did was ddt of alpha. And I'm going to call that gamma. Okay. This term here is going to be called gamma. And I'm just doing that because it... I don't want to write this out every single time. It's a pain, so I'm not going to. <laughs> We're just going to call it gamma. And I believe I have a color problem here. This should have the color pink. All right, so we found gamma. Super. This is E sub t, uh, rewritten with our alpha term. Right, so let's just take a look at that real quick. Um, we have negative a sine t, and then we multiply it by alpha because alpha is one over, you know, the speed here. So it's negative a sine t times alpha. This would be b cosine t times alpha, right? Because one over the speed here all just becomes alpha. And this is just going to be c alpha. So I'm just rewriting e sub t in the simpler form shown here. So once I do that, now I can take the derivative of e sub t, of the tangent direction, and you'll see now that we have two, um, we, we have the product rule for each component, right? We're going to do the product rule here, where this is our first term, and this is our second term. So ddt of our first term times the second, plus the first, plus the first, 
times the derivative of the second. Right, that's just the product rule. Same thing we're going to do now for EY, product rule. Derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. And then finally, the EZ, derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. And I'm missing a color again on my C. <laughs> there we go. So you can see, we already did this DDT of alpha. We did that here. That's just equal to gamma. So now we can just sub that right in and it's, it's much easier. So let's see if we can get this all on one page. So DDT of this first term here is negative A cosine of T, derivative of sine is cosine, times alpha, times alpha, minus A sine of T, minus A sine of T, times ddt of alpha. That's just gamma. We already found that. So that's our ex term. Let's go to the next one. ddt of b cosine t, that's equal to negative b sine t times alpha, times alpha, plus b cosine t, b cosine t, ddt of alpha, we already found it, gamma. And then finally, uh, ez. Well, the derivative of a constant is zero, so that just goes to zero. So this is C times gamma. C times gamma. Again with colors. Missed a few here. There we go. C, gamma. So this here is DDT of ET. That's this. Let's find the magnitude. Well, the magnitude of the derivative uh, of ET is just like we did before, the, the, the square of each of the components sum together, square rooted. So square root of this component squared plus this component squared plus this component squared. And I'm not going to simplify this anymore. I don't have to. I don't really care what it is. I'm just going to call it beta. So I don't have to keep rewriting all this, <laughs> right? Beta. So e sub n... Uh, recall, is equal to the derivative of e of t divided by the magnitude of the derivative of et. Well, we already know this term here, that's this, and all we're doing is dividing it by beta, right? So we have this term, this term, divide by beta, because that is the magnitude of et, d, et, dt. And then our y term is here, divided by beta. And then finally, our z term divided by beta. That's it. That's our e sub n. We did it. e sub n is this right here. No need to simplify it. I don't care. That's what it is. When we plug it into Python, you know, we're going to define what beta is. We define what alpha is. We define what uh, uh, gamma is. And, and Python takes care of everything for us. We don't have to simplify not our job. Okay, finally, e sub b is equal to e sub t crossed with e sub n. This here is e sub t. That's e sub t. That came from uh, right here. This is e sub t. Crossed with, crossed with e sub n. We just found e sub n. It's this. And I just plugged it in right here. And now we have a bit of a few terms to do with the cross product. So first, let's start with uh, the first term. So e sub x crossed with e sub x is zero. Nothing to do with that one. e sub x crossed with e sub y is e sub z. And we're just going to multiply these terms. This one multiplied by this one. e sub x crossed with e sub y is e sub z, right? So that's this here. Next, e sub x crossed with e sub z. That's equal to negative e y. And all I did was just multiply these, these components. All right, let's move to the next one. e sub y crossed with e sub x. That's negative e z. Negative e z. And then I multiplied the components. Um, what's the other one? This one. Here. All right. And then 
Uh, we do e sub y cross with e sub y, that is zero, nothing to do there. e sub y cross with e sub z, that gives you e sub x, e sub x. And we did this term here, multiply by this term here. Finally, last one, e sub z cross with e sub x, what's that, e sub y, positive e sub y, and we're just going to do c alpha times the e sub x term. e sub z cross with e sub y is negative e sub x, and again this term, multiplied by this term. And then finally, e sub, e, e sub z cross with e sub z is zero. So that's it. Um, this is just me collecting each of the terms, right? So I'm taking the e sub x term, and there should be another one. Yeah, right here, e sub x term. And I'm bringing those together into one e sub x term. And then I do the same for e sub y and e sub z. So this whole thing here is e sub b. That whole thing here is e sub b. We found e sub n here, and then we found e sub t here. We're done. <laughs> We're done. We did it. We found the intrinsic basis for the helix. Now let's go over to Python so that you can see the animation, and it looks really nice. Okay, let's go. So here we are in Python. Uh, I finally figured out how to do the 3D animation, uh, so I was really excited about that. Uh, just... So everyone remembers I use Spider for my IDE. It's it's free, um, open source. Anyone can use it. Uh, I'll make the code also available so that um, you know anyone can kind of play with it, alter it to their own liking. And so uh, let's just go through it real quick. So this here is a function that I did not write. Uh, staying true to the true uh <laughs> programmer way i uh i just took it from stack overflow but what this this function makes it so that the aspect ratio is equal in in 3d plotting um matplotlib's 3d functionality or 3d axis it doesn't have an aspect ratio equal so that's what this function does um, but yeah, I didn't write this. I, I got it from this guy here. Uh, there's a parameter section where we have A, B, and C, which, which we defined um, and talked about, right? A and B control the shape of our helix. C controls how quickly it uh, goes in the Z direction. This is the duration of our simulation, 10 seconds. And then this is our DT. So 0 0.025 seconds. That's our, that's our step. Um, what do we got here? This is our x coordinate, y coordinate, z coordinate. So this is our position vector. This is where a particle is at any point in time, right? A cosine of time in the x direction, b sine time in the y direction, c time in the uh, z direction. Here's our speed defined just like it is in our notes and our et of x. So our x, um, our x coordinate of et is just gonna be equal to the x coordinate, so wherever the particle is, plus uh, the the vector that we defined it as. Remember, you can put these intrinsic bases anywhere you want, but I want to place it at the point at the particle so that you can see it as it moves along the track, right? So my starting point is always going to be the coordinate of the particle itself, and then I'm just adding the uh, the unit vector component in the x, y, and z direction, and then that will make it so that it it moves around the track with the particle. Here's our alpha. It was just one over speed. Here's gamma. It's really long. Here's beta, another long thing. And then E sub n uh, in the x direction, y direction, z direction for E sub n. Again, uh, same thing where we're starting at the point, ex, uh, x coordinate, y coordinate, z coordinate. And then we go the unit vector uh, in the direction appropriate for the normal vector that we already, that we, um, derived that we just derived and then this is our binormal also pretty long but you know it doesn't matter python does it all for us um, and then this is just the the code for the animation 
So let's go ahead and, and run this. We're running this with a uh, um, amplitude of 2 for A and B, and then C is just 1. So let's run it. It takes a second to run. All right, here it is. So there we go. There's our E sub T, tangent to the track as it moves along our helix. E sub N is pointing in the direction of the of the curvature. And E sub B is uh, E sub T crossed with E sub N. And you can see the blue one is E sub T, orange is E sub N, and E sub B is E sub T crossed with E sub N. So I'll let this one finish out, and then we'll we'll change a parameter to see how it how that affects it. But yeah, hopefully this is a good visualization for the intrinsic. I was glad I got it working. I didn't, I wasn't sure if I was able to get it, but I, I ended up figuring it out from a lot of Googling. All right, so I just changed the shape of it. So now it's going to be more uh, of an oval kind of helix. Let's see, let's see what that looks like. So A, our, our X coordinate is now elongated and our Y is going to be a little shorter. So our X is pretty long here, and then our Y is pretty short. And we can see that if we look on the top, if I rotate this and we look at the top, it should look kind of like an oval. Yeah, and it does. I can't align it perfectly, but that's what we're dealing with, this oval here. And let's, uh, let's go back home. There we go. And I'll let this play one more time so that you can just watch the intrinsic basis and just think to yourself, like, does it make sense? Is you know, ET is tangent, E sub N is always pointing radius of curvature, E sub B is just E sub T crossed with E sub N. So I'll let it play once. All right, pretty cool. So uh we got it working with uh you know, our simple derivation, the root in Python, animation works. Um, and that's it. I'll, uh, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.